All right, so we've got this uh, conveyor belt. It's moving, the belt is moving uphill and to the right at a speed VB. The belt is at an angle theta. And we have this block of ice. It's a slippery block of ice, but not frictionless, okay? Slippery, but not frictionless. There is some friction in this problem. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna place this block of ice uh, at the bottom of the belt here. Place it there, at, initially at rest. And when we let go, there's gonna be enough friction between the belt and the block that the belt is gonna pull that block up the hill. But of course, it's slippery. It's sliding to begin with, right? Um, sometime before the block reaches the top of the belt, the speed of the block will match the speed of the belt. So this, that's the information that's given to us. So I'm going to say that we're given the mass of the block, we're given the angle of the belt, uh, this, the speed of the belt to VB. We're given, uh, I told you there's friction in the problem, so we're giving you the coefficient of static and kinetic friction. And uh, we're always given the G, the gravitational field constant, too, so that, that'll be in there. And what I want you to do is answer the following four questions. So if the block of ice is released at t equals zero, at what time does the speed of the block match the speed of the belt? Ooh. All right. What time do those, those speeds match? And I want you to tell me whether that expression you get uh, makes sense. In other words, does it have the correct sign? Explain. And uh, when the speed of the block matches the speed of the belt, how far has it traveled? Okay, what's, and finally, what's the magnitude of the friction after the block matches the speed of the belt? So I've got a four-part assignment here. Um, so I encourage you to get going on this all by yourself and come back if you're watching this on YouTube or wherever. There is an assignment posted. You can find it in the, in the comments. Um, if you're in my class, you already have the assignment, I, th I assume. Um, but work out the problem itself. Use this video as a way to check your understanding when you're finished. All right, so I'm working out this problem on paper. And the first order of business when solving the problems like this, is, is as specified in the checklist, is I'm drawing a picture, right? I'm labeling various quantities in my problem. For example, the angle of the ramp, the speed of the belt, um, it's a good idea to also put in sort of your basis vectors, so maybe I'll squeeze that in right now. I'm going to call sort of e hat 1 to be the direction tangent to the ramp. Of course, you can give it your own name. And you can decide to make these basis vectors horizontal and vertical if you want to. I think it's kind of easier to do this uh, perpendicular and tangent to the ramp. So e hat 1, e hat 2 will be those coordinate directions. And then, of course, you list the quantities that are given to us. Mass, angle of the ramp, uh, the coefficients of kinetic and static friction, respectively. Uh, we're also going to need G, the gravitational field strength. I always assume that's given, so you can list it or you can leave it off if you want. Might as well just list it. And there's my list of givens. And then I want to list the quantities that I want to find. So the quantity number one. So the first thing we want to find is this thing I'm calling T match. That's my name for it. I didn't give it a name in the problem statement, so I'll just call it T match. It's the time at which the, the speed of the block matches the, the speed of the belt. Second thing I want to find, I'm calling D match. This is the distance the block has traveled at the instant uh, that the speed matches the belt, so at time T match. And finally, the last thing I want to determine is the magnitude of the friction force between the block and the belt. Uh, after that, that instant where they match, right? Where they match the speeds. And that's it. All right, so next step is to draw a free body diagram. So we'll do that here. There's my box. Free body diagram has forces on it, right? So we'll put the, um, put the normal force, or excuse me, put the weight. So here's the weight. Okay, there. So actually, let me put the normal force first. That might be easier. Should put it right there. So normal force is all in the e hat two direction. Normal force means perpendicular to the to the surface. So I'll say n e hat two for that normal force. Notice I'm following the the the, re, the the rules according to the free body diagram checklist and the problem solving checklist. All all forces, all vectors on the free body diagram are labeled as vectors. So n in the e hat 2, that's a vector. Um, 
Then I got the weight. It's important to note that weight points straight down. Some students think or believe that the weight should be uh, <clears throat> perpendicular to the belt for some reason, but it's not. Weight, weight is straight down. Which means what? If, it, if weight is straight down, then it means a portion of it is going to be in the minus e hat 1 direction, and a portion of it is going to be in the minus e hat 2 direction, right? So might as well get that decomposition uh, stated right here. I think it fits better right here. So weight has magnitude m times g. And if you do the vector decomposition, you'll find that uh, a sine theta component of it goes into the minus e hat 1 direction and then a positive, no, still minus I guess, minus mg cosine theta goes in the e hat 2 direction. <clears throat> so there's the weight. Um, a lot of students want to put VB onto the free body diagram. But VB does not begin, belong on the free body diagram, right? VB is a speed. Right? It's the velocity of the belt. The belt would be moving up way up and to the right with speed VB. Uh, that's not a force, right? Only forces go on free body diagrams because only forces produce mass times acceleration. So only forces, no VB on there. So the next thing is friction. Let's talk about friction really quick. You'll notice in this problem, I gave you coefficients of kinetic and static friction, right? So first of all, do we have kinetic friction or do we have static friction? That's the first uh, choice to make. Think about it for a second. We can actually work this out. Well, initially the block is not moving, right? The block is stationary. The belt is moving. Block is stationary. So one might say that the since the block is stationary, we should have static friction, right? The block isn't moving initially. But wait a second. The important thing to notice is not whether the block is moving or not. It's whether the surfaces are sliding relative to each other. Here are the surfaces. I mean, this the bottom surface of the block and the top surface of this belt. These are the two surfaces that are in contact, right? Here's my, here's the surface of the block. Here's the surface of the belt. They're in contact. Yeah, and what's going on? The block here, the block, this hand, top hand, it's stationary. But the bottom surface, the belt, it's moving, right? Those two surfaces are sliding against each other. Because I've got this sliding going on, the sliding, the scraping, the scrubbing, whatever you want to call this, this relative motion between the two surfaces, because the, those two surfaces are sliding against each other, that means we have kinetic friction. Okay, kinetic friction is when surfaces are sliding against each other and, and that just the fact that these surfaces are rubbing against each other creates friction, right? That's what we have here. Static friction would mean the two surfaces are just squished against each other and maybe they're moving together, maybe they're just sitting together uh, still. But in this case, we've got sliding, right? Just like this, sliding. All right, so therefore, we should have a kinetic friction on here. Um, I haven't put an arrowhead on that force yet. Should that arrow force, should that friction force, friction force by definition is tangent to the belt, uh, should that friction force be up and to the right or down and to the left? Which way? Now again, this is a confusing part to a lot of students. A lot of students will look at this and they'll say, hey, the, the problem statement says the block is going uphill. Since the block is going uphill, the friction force must oppose that motion. Right? Be careful. Be careful. Sometimes it's better to embody this and feel it again. So here's these two surfaces, the block and the belt. They're here. Initially, the block is not moving, so my, my upper hand is going to stay stationary. My belt is going to move. What does the block feel, right? We're drawing a free body diagram for the block, so these are the forces that the block feels. It's got this belt scraping against it, scrubbing it, tugging it. 
the belt is trying to pull the block uphill, right? Right? The belt is trying to push the block, pull the block, tug the block this way. Yeah? Yeah, that's what's going on. It's feeling a force upward and to the right. That's the direction of friction. In this case, friction isn't opposing the motion of the block. Friction is causing the block to start moving uphill. The friction is the only thing pulling up the hill. And maybe I should say, point out this. So we, t we were explicitly told in the problem that the belt pulls the thing uphill. The belt is the only force that goes uphill. The only belt is the only force that goes to the right, so it has to go to the right. The, it, 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 that, that friction force has to go to the right. Otherwise, there's no way for the belt, for the block to accelerate upward and to the right. So here's the friction force. I'll just call it F. And it's going to be in the E hat 1 direction. Right? FBD. All right, so the next thing we need to do is draw a mass acceleration diagram. So let me put it over here. Um, I label it MAD. And the whole point of a mass acceleration diagram is to write the right-hand side of Newton's second law, mass times acceleration. So we've got this uh, block of ice. It starts off at s equals 0. So it starts off over here. And then the block just sort of cruises uphill, according to the problem statement. So the position of the block, if I were to call that r, that's my usual notation for position, the vector, or the position vector r, is, let's say if I call this 0, starting point 0, then r is an, a distance s in the e hat 1 direction, right? It's by definition, it's the location of the block. It's a vector on the e hat 1 direction. So velocity would be the time derivative of position. So if I take just a time derivative of this, then I get s dot e hat 1. And since e hat 1 is a constant, that's all you get. And then acceleration would be s double dot e hat 1. It's getting a little crowded over here. All right, so there's my position velocity acceleration vectors. What I want on my mass acceleration diagram is just mass times acceleration. So mass times acceleration is this way. M S double dots in the E hat one direction. Now some students when they're starting off on this journey here might draw a mass times acceleration diagram for each one of the forces, right? For, I've got a force here, it has a, it has a mass acceleration, here's another force, it has its mass times acceleration, here's another one, yeah? Uh, no, right? Acceleration is a very clear definition. Acceleration is the second time derivative of position. There's only one position, it's how far you are up the hill. So therefore it should be only one acceleration, mass times the second derivative of the height up the hill. So there's your mass acceleration diagram. Now it's really important that when we're drawing these diagrams, we're, we're being very methodical and careful. Because if we get the diagrams correct, then a lot of the rest of this follows pretty straightforwardly. Simply going forward, you just apply the physical principles and then definitions. So now that we have the diagrams drawn, the next step is to state the physical principle we are going to use. So in this case, it's going to be Newton's second law which states that the sum of the forces acting on the object is equal to mass times acceleration, right? So the left-hand side of Newton's second law is sum of all the forces. Those are the forces we see on the free body diagram. The right-hand side, of course, is mass times acceleration, which is on the other diagram. So to construct the equations of motion here, it's simply a matter of so reading the forces right off the, off the uh, diagrams. So Newton's second law, we'll start with the e hat 1 component, right? Newton's second law is a vector equation. Sum of vectors on the left-hand side equals a vector on the right-hand side. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to pull off the various pieces of this. So I say e, e hat 1 comma. That means I'm going to pull off the pieces in the e hat 1 direction. So notice that I have this friction force in the positive e hat 1 direction. Notice I have, um, what is it, component of the weight minus mg sine theta in the e hat 1, too. So let me subtract off mg sine theta. 
uh, normal force is all in the E hat too. So those are my only two components of forces in the E hat one direction. So this has to equal mass times acceleration in the E hat one. So in the E hat one, I got ms double dot, where s double dot is the second time derivative of this uh, position, the distance from the, the from the starting point. All right, so that's what we got in the E hat one direction. In the E hat two direction, let me just write that one out really quickly. In the E hat two direction, again, look at my diagram. I've got N in E hat two, and I've got mg cosine theta in the two, in the E hat two, minus mg cosine theta, right? And then I put mass times acceleration in the E hat two direction, but there is no acceleration in the E hat two. All the acceleration's in the E hat one. E hat two is perpendicular to E hat one. Therefore, it has no acceleration that way. And there we go. So there's our equations of motion. All right, so where does this, what, what does this do for us? Well, let's go back and look at what we're supposed to find again. This is why we, why we list them out explicitly here. I want to find the time at which the speed of the block matches the belt. Well, the, this, talking about the speed of the block, what we have here is essentially the acceleration of the block, right? To get something related to the speed of the block, I'm going to have to integrate that acceleration. I just have to solve that acceleration, then integrate it, right? And then I'm going to ask for the distance it's traveled uh, in that in that time. So distance is a position. So I'm going to have to integrate a second time to get position, right? So I'm thinking I'm going to have to f separate out that acceleration, and then. Um, and do some integration. So let's look at this first equation. This is going to tell us that S double dot is equal to um, this friction force divided by M minus uh, G sine theta. Because I'm dividing everything by M, right? So minus G sine theta. So there's the S double dot. That's cool. Now I can go ahead and integrate if I know everything in here. Let's look at this. I got the th give, my list of givens up top here. Notice that this F here, the friction force, is not given. Coefficients of friction are given, but not the friction force itself, right? These are coefficients of friction, not the friction force itself. The friction force, remember this is kinetic friction. This is a sliding friction. I'm going to have to figure that out. Remember that sliding friction is proportional to the normal force. Ooh, boy. Right, the normal force is the force from the belt acting on the block. And so, well look, we got a normal force down here, right? So this second equation right here tells me that the normal force is equal to m times g times cosine of theta. Notice that this expression for the normal force, where did it come from? It came from Newton's second law. It didn't pop out of some general knowledge that the normal force is always equal to the perpendicular force opposing it. It's only, <laughs> forces, normal force is only equal to mg cosine theta because there's no acceleration in that direction. If I had a curvy path, right, if this was a curvy path rather than a straight line, then I would have an acceleration. We'll talk about that a little later on. This is meaning a different day. Uh, but since the path is straight as an arrow, I've got no acceleration perpendicular to the path, which means these two forces have to add up to zero. They have to balance each other out. So there's my normal force. So this tells me, just by using the Coulomb model of friction, this tells me that friction force, which is mu k n, is going to be equal to mu k times mg cosine theta. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute that into this equation star. So we'll substitute this into equation star, which will give us that S double dot is equal to mu kg cosine theta minus g sine theta. Or I can write it a little simpler, like so. So here's my acceleration. Notice I have the acceleration, this s double dot, this I should really call it a component of acceleration. I have this s double dot in terms of what? g mu k theta, g mu k theta, right? g mu k and theta are all given to me. 
So we have the acceleration, right? We have an expression for acceleration that we can use going forward. Everything here is known. Furthermore, what else? Um, furthermore, notice that uh, g is a constant, mu k is a constant, and theta is a constant. So all these terms here are constants. So s double dot is a constant. That's kind of nice because constants are easy to integrate, by the way. Uh, not only is it constant, is this a negative constant or a positive constant? I mean, let's just think for a second. Is that a negative constant or a positive constant? Let's think about it. So that thing's coming from here, right? This thing is essentially the friction force divided by the mass minus the weight divided by the mass, okay? So I'm going to look over here, or maybe I should be looking over here. Here's the F, my friction force. Here's my component of the weight, the minus mg sine theta. Right? These are the two pieces in the e hat one direction. Which one of these is bigger? Well, I am told by the, in the problem statement that this when, when we release the block, I'm told that the block heads uphill. Right? There's only one way it can head uphill is if it ex, it's accelerating at a constant rate. Right? The only way it can head uphill is if my acceleration is positive. The only way it can head uphill if, is if my, my uh, friction force minus that component of the weight, if that is a vector, the sum of those two vectors is something up the hill. So that means what? That means this f has to be bigger than the mg sine theta. Yeah? It means f has to be bigger than the mg sine theta, which, which means mu k mg cosine theta has to be bigger than mg sine theta, which means that mu k cosine theta has to be bigger than sine theta. So all of this has to be a positive constant. So I'm writing here in my solution the reason my, my thinking here. So friction force is bigger than mg sine theta. So B, I'll say because the problem states that the block travels up the hill. Right? So you need the positive con you need a positive acceleration for that to happen. You need a force, net force pushing up the hill for that to happen. Yeah, let's take some thinking here. The next thing I want to do in this in this problem is to sort of get the big picture of what's happening. I'm going to draw start drawing some plots, kind of like what we've done in class already. So here I've drawn a set of axes for s as a function of time, s dot as a function of time and s double dot as a function of time. Right, so the, let's see, the problem is telling us right here that s double dot is this positive constant. Right, so this is going to be a really simple curve, positive constant. This is as long, by the way, this is long as the belt is moving faster than the block of ice, right? As long as the belt is moving faster than the block of ice, there's sliding going on, right? The two surfaces are going at different speeds, so there'll be sliding going on. Um, everything we've done so far assumes I've got this kinetic friction here. So as long as they're sliding, this is what's going on. So up until that time we're interested in, I've got a positive constant acceleration. So let me just draw that s double dot, a uh, positive constant for some amount of time. I won't go all the way to the end because I want to find the time at which this thing uh, matches the speed of the belt. Okay. So what does that mean about s dot? Well, in the problem statement, it says the block starts off with zero speed. So the block is going to start off right there at zero speed. Right? S dot is equal to zero. But s double dot's a positive constant, so s dot has to be a linearly growing function. It has to grow at a constant rate. Yeah? And then if s dot starting at zero, what do I get for the s? s is going to start off at zero, right? S, since s dot starts off at zero, that means this thing has zero slope initially. But its slope is steadily increasing. So if I got a slope that's steadily increasing for the s curve, it should look something like this. And then let's just get more big picture here. Let's get more big picture here. Where's the belt speed? Well, the belt speed is a speed, right? <laughs> Here's the belt speed. And my these, this, these trends here are going to keep on happening as long as the speed of the block does not match the belt speed. 
right? As long as we got that sliding action going on, as long as we get that kinetic friction. Well, I'm going to put the belt speed on my S dot curve. I'll call it VB right there. Right? VB has a value. I can just chug it across all the way over here. Right? I got my S dot for the block increasing right, at a constant rate. Eventually, the speed of the block is going to match the speed of the belt. Right? It's, the block is getting faster and faster and faster. Eventually, it's going to match the speed of the belt. Well, there's the instant it matches the belt speed. Right? There's the instant where things change. Right? So nothing we've drawn extends beyond that, that line right there. And I think this is telling us how to find the time at which things match. So T match is right there. By the way, what do I call it? Distance match? Distance match is going to be the distance the block has traveled at that time. So this is D match right there. Wow, look at that. The whole rest of the problem has now revealed itself to me. All I have to do is figure this stuff out. Cool. Do you see the big picture? The big picture is, or should be, in our sights now. All right, now that I have this roadmap on how to solve this problem, let's go to it, right? Here's my S double dot. Let's integrate to get S dot, right? Got the constant positive S double dot. Let's find this curve right here. So here's my S double dot. So I'll say integrate to find S dot. And here's the integral with respect to time, right? So the, the, der the time derivative of S dot is S double dot. So to get the to get s dot back I integrate s double dot with respect to time all right so again uh, this g the mu k the cosine theta these are all constants right g mu k cosine theta sine theta uh, and we're integrating with respect to t so this is just some this this constant times t Right, there's that constant, here's the time t, and don't forget to add in your constant of integration. Right, the constant of integration is used to determine your boundary condition, right? Because we're looking for the integral of this curve, right? We want to find a curve whose slope is this positive constant. There's a whole bunch of curves here with the positive constant slope. We're equal to that constant, right? There's a whole family of these things with the same slope. What we want to do is we want to find the one that starts off with s dot equals zero. That's our, that's our initial condition, right? We were told that the block of ice starts off at rest. So S dot has to be 0. So let's we'll say initial condition, or IC, tells us that S dot evaluated at T equals 0 has to be 0. Well, S dot is this G mu k cosine theta minus sine theta times 0, right? t is 0 plus c1. That has to be 0. So I get 0 times this stuff, which is all 0. That just leaves c1 equals 0, right? So there, get that, that, there tells us what s dot is, right? There's my s dot. Now, let me go back to something. Um, I did this by direct integration, right? I got the s dot from the s double dot through direct integration. Now, in your initial physics class or someplace else, you might have learned some so-called kinematics equations or kinematics relationships. Um, I tell you in this problem, where is it? Here it is. I say in the problem, do not use so-called kinematic relationships that you may have learned elsewhere, unless you're willing, of course, to, der to derive them from first principles, all right? The reason I don't want to use don't want you to use those kinematics relationships because you know they're easy to commit to memory, but it's these relationships you may have may have in your memory banks are not valid under all circumstances. And if you rely on them blindly, not understanding them when you can use them and when you cannot use them, then you're doomed to make mistakes. So I suggest not using it. Okay? What I suggest you do just like we did here, what I suggest you do is just integrate, okay? Integration of these things, or these, these ones are really simple. 
Yeah, and you can hit those boundary conditions. This, this just relies upon the definition of acceleration and velocity. You don't have to know any other assumptions. All right, so we're doing direct integration. So here's our expression for s dot. Okay, let's go back and see where we're going again. I can integrate again to find s, but before we do, let's look what we want. The first thing we want to find is the time at which the speed of the block matches the speed of the belt. Well, here I have an expression for the speed of the block right there. And what I want to do is I want to match the speed of the belt. Well, look at my expression right here, s dot. I got it in terms of g, mu k, theta, and t. Right here's an it's a, it's a s dot's changing in time, right? But the g, the mu k, and the theta, those are quantities that are all given to us, right? So, wow, we have this entire function right there. All I need to do is find the time at which this function goes through the speed of the belt, VB. It matches the speed of the belt. So all I have to do is match that condition, right? So, so I'll say it right here. The speed of the ice block matches the speed of the belt when I have S dot, and I'm calling that at time T match. S dot at T match, which is equal to what I say? It's right up here. G uk cosine theta minus sine theta times we're putting in that value of t t match is equal to the belt speed huh now i can find the t match right everything in here is known except for the t match that's what i want to find so let me find it so t match is just vb divided by this mu k cosine theta minus sine theta did i leave out a g i think i left out a g didn't i ho oh, can't forget the g this is my answer to question number one, if I like it. Let's, let's check the units, check the dimensions. Checking dimensions is required in these problems. Required, you can't just skip it, right? It's a very important uh, task to do. So, what I want is a time out of this thing, right? T matches the time at which the, the belt and the block match their speeds. So the stuff on the right-hand side better be a time. So let's check it out. Um, so in the numerator, it's a speed, right? So speed is a length divided by time. It's in meters per second, or miles per hour, or feet per year, something like that. So that's a length divided by time in the, in the, in the uh, top. In the bottom, the denominator, what do I have? What's the, what are the units of mu k? Yeah, we thought about it. What's, what are the units of mu k? Well, remember how coefficient of kinetic friction works. In fact, I think I have it written over here. We used it right here, right? The friction force is equal to mu k times the normal force, right? Friction is a force. This normal force is a force. Both friction and, for and normal force have the same dimensions here. Therefore, mu k has to be dimensionless, right? It's a dimensionless quantity. It's a nothing. It's a nothing. It's a ratio. Right, so mu k is a nothing. Cosine theta, what's a cosine theta? Well, again, done this in class, draw a little triangle here. What's cosine of theta, theta if I were to draw this triangle? Well, cosine of theta is, what? where's theta again? Theta is this angle right here. So cosine theta is this length of the triangle divided by that length of the triangle. It's a length divided by a length, which is, again, unitless. So cosine is unitless. Minus sine is also unitless, right? Sine is the opposite side, the length of the opposite divide, side divided by the hypotenuse. It's a length divided by a length. So everything in the denominator here, at least everything, uh, maybe we should say, in these parentheses, are all ones, right? One blows, well, just one one here, right there. That's all ones. And I don't know if you remember, just a moment ago, I almost forgot to put the, the G there, right? I almost forgot to put the G there. If I didn't have the G there, my, if I forgot to put the G there, then my dimension check would have found the error, right? If without the G there, the dimensions on this left-hand side is just a length divided by time. I need a time, right? That would have caught my mistake, but I, I caught my mistake without doing the dimensions. The G 
has units of length per time squared, right? This is 9.81 meters per second squared, or 32.2 feet per second squared. This is a length meter per time second squared, per time squared. All right, so a length divided by time divided by a length per time squared is a time, so the dimension check checks out. Another thing you can, so checking the dimensions is absolutely necessary. Uh, there's some other thinking you can do about this if you want. In fact, I encourage you to do so. Not required, but I encourage you to do so. Ask if this, if this solution makes sense, right? Um, I'm asking for a time at which the block and the belt match the speed. They start off at time equals zero where they're sliding against each other. The, the block is speeding up as we go along. I'm thinking that this time better be in the future, right? If time equals zero is the time at which it starts, this better be some number that's bigger than zero. Ooh, is this a number bigger than zero? Well, VB is positive, right? This is just a belt speed moving at constant speed. G is positive, again, 9.81 meters per second squared if you wish. Uh, so for T match to be positive, that means this term in parentheses right here, the mu k cosine theta minus sine theta, has to be uh, positive, right? And it is, isn't it? In fact, you can write this this thing. Um, where will I do it? I'll probably do it right here. This thing in the denominator here. Uh, if I want, I can write this. Multiply both sides by m, mvb over mg mu k cosine theta minus sine theta. Oops. mg sine theta. So here's another way of writing this exact same thing. I just multiplied both top and bottom by m, and I expanded out the denominator, right? So mg mu k cosine theta. Well, mg mu k cosine theta, that's just the friction force, right? And here's the component of the weight. We argued previously, uh, where'd it go? I think it's right on this page. We argued that, that the friction force has to be bigger than mg sine theta. So therefore, this denominator, this denominator has to be positive. That's exactly what we want. That's exactly what we need. The thing's bigger than zero, the time is bigger than zero, and I'm feeling more confidence about my, um, my answer, so I'm going to put a box around it. And I'm done with part one of uh, what I'm asked, asked to find. Right? This is magnitude with an E on there. Cool, so the next thing I want to do is check that the, the I want to find the distance traveled, right? That's my second thing. D match, distance traveled at time T match. Well, all I have to do is, again, here's my big picture. Uh, I just found this time T match now, and I have just have to integrate, if I integrate the S dot to find the S, I can take this expression for S and evaluate it at this time T match, and that will give me the D match. Easy peasy, right? So now I want to integrate. Integrate what? I want to integrate my expression for s dot, right? So integrate s dot, which is equation, I'll give it a, a symbol here, give it equation pound sign. So I want to integrate, I'll say, equation pound sign to find position as a function of time. So here's what I'm integrating. There's that, there's that expression for velocity that we had before, the s dot. Right, we're integrating this with respect to time. So dt, right, this term in parentheses here is just a constant, so it's really I'm just integrating t with respect to t, which is 1 half t squared. Got that coefficient along for the ride. And then I've got to add in a constant of integration again, right? This is an indefinite integral. So there's my position as a function of time. To find out what C2 is, you do what? You match an initial condition, right? This S start, or I should say this block of ice starts off at S equals zero. So therefore this plot should start off at S equals zero. So when time equals zero, S equals zero. 
So my initial condition tells me that S evaluated at time equals zero, which is equal to at this constant here, and then a t squared, so we're doing it t equals zero, so I get zero squared plus c2 has to be zero, uh, which just leaves c2 is zero, right? So this tells me that c2 is zero, and my expression for s as a function of time, oops, just gotta put it up there. My expression for s as a function of time is this one right here, boom. Nice, easy, peasy. Boundary conditions for this problem happen to be really easy. They both turned out to be zero. In general, they're not going to be zero. So you really have to consider the boundary conditions every single time and give it uh, serious consideration. All right, so now I think I'm on the verge of answering the question, right? I want to know that the distance traveled at the time t match, right? I've got distance traveled as a function of time down here, and I've got time t match right there, so I just gotta substitute this thing into here. Again, in my solution, I'm describing what I'm doing, right? So I'm gonna substitute what we got for t match into this expression above. I'm saying that the distance traveled at, at the matching time is equal to s evaluate that time t match, which is equal to, so here I've just written what? I've just written this coefficient right out in front of the t squared, right? g mu k cosine theta minus sine theta, g mu k cosine theta over sine theta, all divided by two. So I just make the two look a little differently, look a little different. Now I have to take this expression for t match and put it in, right? t match squared is gonna go right there. There's t, I'm gonna put t match squared. t match is this one up here. So this is going to be VB, right? I'm taking T match squared. So this is VB squared divided by, and I got mu K cosine theta minus sine theta, right? That's what we got under here times G all squared. Ho oh, ho. And I think that does it. Notice things cancel each other out, right? I've got G mu K cosine theta minus sine theta. Here's G mu K cosine theta minus sine theta. I got squared there. So this one right here cancels out one of these two down there. And what I'm left is with D match divided by what I got two times one of these things left, mu k cosine theta minus sine theta. Ooh, there's a G there too, so I pull that out front. Ooh, I think that's it. Yeah, I just solved it. I, I sim and I simplified it a little bit. So here's where we go. Let's do another dimension check, see if the dimensions work out. Dimension check. So in the numerator, I have a VB squared. So what do we have? Is So VB is the length over time squared. I got a length squared over time squared, right? Ooh, okay. And then in the, in the denominator, I have two times G. G is the length per time squared. Okay. And then the stuff in parentheses here, mu k was dimensionless, cosine's dimensionless, sine's dimensionless. So all this is dimensionless down here. So this me gives me, le oops, I don't need this much line. So this gives me a length per time squared divided by a length, this me the length squared per time squared divided by length per time squared. So these length, since, so these one over time squareds cancel each other out. This length cancels one of those lengths. So this is a length, and that's exactly what I want. I need my expression to give me a length. You can check the sign if you want again. Mu k minus cos mu k cosine theta minus sine theta. We've already said that was positive. Uh, Vb squared's positive. Anything squared's positive, or at least not negative. And we got two in the g. Everything's positive here, right? The stuff in the parentheses is positive, and everything else is positive. So therefore, I guess I'm feeling comfortable about my, about my solution again. So I'm going to call this one my answer. I'll put a box around it. Yes, yes. All right, so this takes care of the second thing we were asked to find, right? The distance at the matching time. The third thing I have on my list of things to find here is the magnitude of the friction force after that time T match, right? T match is when, they, when the, when the uh, block of ice 
matches the speed of the conveyor belt. Now let's think about this. When the block, so let me get my hands back down here again. So the top, the top hand, this one, when it matches the speed of the belt, so it's being pulled up by the belt, but eventually they match and they move together as one. At least for an instant, they're moving together as one, right? Once they match, then we have, at least for one instant, a condition where the two surfaces are not sliding relative to each other, right? So now we have the possibility of static friction. In other words, we have the possibility that these two surfaces stick together and stay together, right? If they stick together and stay together, what's happening? That means the box here would be moving at a constant speed, the speed of the belt. So let me write this down right here. So at time t match, the two surfaces, the block and the belt, are no longer sliding. In other words, there's a possibility that those two objects remain stuck together. So what we do, so what we do in this case is we look at this table I have in the, in the dynamics reference. I'm hoping you looked at it. Right? It says how to handle systems with friction. So does the system have friction? Yes, it has friction. Are the surfaces sliding? They were sliding. In, that ca in the case where they're sliding, the friction force is mu k times the normal force. But now, at this moment, things are not sliding, right? So if things are not sliding, what I suggest we do is calculate the static friction force required to keep the surfaces from sliding, right? So let's assume they stick together. If they stick together, then, then what? Then the box and the belt move as one. They're moving together. And the belt is what? The belt's moving at a constant speed. There's no acceleration. OK, let's go back and look at this. All right, I've redrawn the free body diagram, yeah? I'm, I'm assuming these, these, the box and the belt are stuck together. Let's, let's just suppose they're stuck together, okay? So again, the weight is exactly the same as it was before. The normal force, uh, I've drawn it the same way as before. A friction force, again, I have the same thing. But if they remain stuck together, the box is moving at the constant speed of the belt. So mass times acceleration is zero. I got the zero vector right there. Ho, 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 ho. That means we've got static equilibrium essentially, right? Some of these forces are going to be equal to zero. So again, uh, Newton's second law says that in the e hat one direction, now we've got the friction force is equal to, oops, let me write it this way, friction force minus mg sine theta. In this case, it would equal zero, right? The friction force would equal mg sine theta. Yeah? If that were the case. But is that the case? Right? Let's go back to my, t my, my table. Where is it? It's over here. All right. So I just calculated the, f the static friction force required to keep the surfaces from sliding. Right? This, this friction to keep the surface from sliding is the friction which holds the thing in static equilibrium. Now the question is, is that friction force less than equal to mu s? Is the force, I should say, greater than mu s times n? Is it greater than the breaking force, the force that breaks free? Is the answer yes? If yes, then it goes back to sliding friction. If the answer is no, if the friction to keep the two surfaces stuck together is less than this breaking force, then we they remain stuck together. Well, tell me, is this friction force less than the breaking force? Right? Well, remember, the breaking force, F break, is greater than the static, or excuse me, the kinetic friction force, right? mu k n, right? It takes more force to break two surfaces apart than the, than the kinetic friction, right? But remember what the kinetic friction was. The kinetic friction, well, let me go back to it. I think we said it right here. The kinetic friction uh, was mu, whoa. here we go. The kinetic friction was bigger than mg sine theta, right? We, the kinetic friction was, had to be 
bigger than this component of the weight in order to get the acceler get get the uh, acceleration to be positive in order to get the belt to to pull the block up the up the uh, up the belt right we assume that that happened because in this problem statement we we said that the, we placed the block of ice on the belt and eventually it pulled it up the up, up the ramp so this friction force had to be by definition bigger than the mg sine theta that's what we said way back here. And the static friction force to keep it put is mg sine theta. So guess what? The static friction force is less is equal, is less than the is less than the breaking force because the static friction force is less than the kinetic friction force. So the breaking force is greater than mu kn, which is the static which is the kinetic friction force which is greater than mg sine theta. Uh-huh. So therefore, this thing remains stuck. And this is our, that, this is the static friction force we get after um, T match. Right there. And guess what? We're done. And we've already discussed, well, we can just check the units again if you want to check the dimensions. Force, I'm expecting, uh, uh, this is, Friction force, right? So it has to be force. M times G is is a force, right? Has, M has units of mass. G has units of length over time squared. Mass length over time. Sine theta is dimensionless, so mass length over time squared is a force. And we're finished. This is it. Ta-da! I want you to notice that um, I, g I give you a dynamics problem here. When I worked out my dynamics problem, uh, look how many pages it took me. It took me three pages. So one full page here. And I've got a PDF copy of this I'll post on online. Another page, second page here. A third page here. This is not, these problems are not problems that sh you should be able to, here's, here's, what, here's what I find students do. Uh, bring back the uh, Break the problem statement again. So a lot of students, I'll give them a homework assignment that fits on a page, and what the what students try to do is fit their entire work into this little tiny space at the bottom, which is ridiculous, right? Let your work take out some space. Take some space here. In my, in my case, it took three whole pages, so that you can write and express your your thoughts clearly and and fully, right? So don't be shy to, to use some paper here. All right? I use scratch paper so I don't kill any extra trees, but you can do what you want. I want you to I'd prefer you write something that, that's easy to follow. All right, so I'm, I'm finished.